But before we do that, uh, Robin and I are going to make a little pitch. Um, we are stand up here um, from the Bill Home Center of, for the Study of Northwest Coast Art at the Burke Museum, and we're pitching our grant program. So I'll let Robin okay. do that. He's our director. Yeah, I don't know how many of you uh, know that at the Burke Museum, um, the Bill Home Center gives out grants every year to people who want to come to Seattle and study the Burke Museum collection. And so we will pay your airfare to fly to Seattle. We'll give you an honorarium that will cover your hotel and food while you're there. Uh, and we will get out anything you want to see in our collection. Um, and just uh, not only the object collection, but historic photos or uh, archival materials. And you'd also have access to the University of Washington uh, Special Collections and Library. So we want to encourage anyone who is here to uh, Tell your friends the application date uh, is uh, April 20th, so it's coming right up in uh, three weeks, less than three weeks. And the if, if you're interested, pick up a brochure. There's a website where you can download the application form. Send us uh, your your materials, uh, either artists or just people interested in general research. Uh, we'd love to bring you down and uh, encourage you to tell all your friends to apply for the Bill Home Center Visiting Researcher Grant. So. We'll leave these up here, on, and I think there's some on, scattered around on various tables. So, um, or you can just Google Bill Home Center and go to the the up at the top and click Grants, and you'll see all the past recipients. Tommy Joseph was one of our past recipients, and I don't see any others in there. But Steve Brown is on our board and helps us uh, decide who to get grants to. So I encourage you all to. And Jan is on our board. Jan Criswell comes down for the board meetings, and so. You can talk to Jan or Steve or Katie or me about the grants and hope to see some of your names in the pile. Thank you. All right, should we maybe turn the lights a little bit? That's a possibility. Of course, now it's hard to see up here. Oh, well. Um, so I wanted to say first, of course, some thank yous to the Sitka clans for having us here, and to Steve Hendrickson and Peter Metcalf for organizing, and for Sergey Khan for inviting us to put together this session. Um, and I want to welcome Ashley Verplank and Emily Moore and Alexis Button, who are going to hear from this afternoon. The paper that I'm going to talk about today is a article that I'm that I'm writing for actually a volume that Alexis is editing. Um, called Cultural Tourism Movements, New Articulations of Indigenous Identity. Uh, and the volume really is very much about contemporary indigenous tourism and some investigations of that. But there's a couple of historical chapters. And, and so I want to look at what are the things that happened in the late 19th century, the beginning of the tourist trade in Southeast Alaska. Um, and then hopefully I'm going to move in to the future, not during this paper today, to, to looking at the connections to what's happening today as well. In the 1880s, the advent of regular steamship service to Southeast Alaska caused the tourist economy to boom in the small coastal villages. And over the next several decades, tourism became the fastest growing economic engine of the region. Like the yearly salmon run, so familiar to native people, travelers from the states arrived in waves, storing up fodder for their journals and spawning future returns of tourists. These were formative years for the burgeoning native art market. They had artists reaping the benefits of the new cash economy, selling their artworks to tourists, travelers, dealers, anthropologists. And travelers were anxious to buy souvenirs directly from native vendors, an activity which the tourist literature touted as an integral part of the Alaskan tour. Native artists skillfully negotiated the demands of tourists who had a specific set of expectations and desires based on those published travelogues that they were familiar with. And the market for their products provided rich opportunities to earn money in ways that were acceptable to the officials in the colonial world of the new American territory, while still allow it, allowing carvers and weavers to set their own schedules and follow the market, or participate in customary food harvesting or potlatching, basically fitting this into the traditional seasonal round of resource gathering. As colonial policies alienated Native people, from their traditional economies, the growth of the tourist trade brought new opportunities for practicing and performing culture for the cash economy. Most importantly, being successfully self-employed brought the resources to, to participate 
in the colonial economy, as well as funds to reinforce hereditary positions or to increase status within indigenous systems without regard for or even in contradiction to colonial policies, policies against those systems. This paper considers how native artists exploited the fertile ecosystem of the tourist trade. Native artists knew well how to tend the seasonal tourist runs, ensuring that tourists left silver dollars shimmering in their wakes. Today I want to look at those first decades of commercial tourism in Southeast Alaska at the end of the 19th century and to discuss a few examples of artworks that were crucial to this economy. I want to be clear here that I don't assume to speak for, for any of the native artists or vendors of the time, but I hope that this research can reveal new perspectives into the production side of the tourist market um, as compared to the consumer and the collector side, which has been um, well documented by other authors in recent years. By examining artworks in their commercial context, it's possible to gain perspective on how artists navigated the rough waters of the new colonial economy, trading on non-native notions of authenticity and expression and timing their production of artworks to the seasonal cycle of the tourist runs to maximize their economic returns. While the real tourist boom did not hit Southeast Alaska until the Pacific Coast Steamship Company began cruise, passenger cruise ship service in 1884, the freight and mail runs that had served had been uh, bringing tourists to the coast in smaller numbers for decades, and so the, the idea of the cash economy was in place, but it was just sort of small at the time. But the popularity of the cruises grew quickly once regular steamship service began in 1884. In Native communities, supplies and goods for everyday life were purchased with the money earned through the tourist trade. The money was used for potlatching, and Clinket and Haida potlatches um, of the 80, 1880s and 90s often featured gifts of money, as well as purchased and locally produced goods and food. Cash, used to purchase manufactured goods or for distribution or display itself, was critical to the honoring of high-ranking chiefs, who by the late 19th century might be more memorialized under, um, quote, a mountain of cloth, or, quote, with wash basins full of silver currency. The um, 1890 census talked about some Plinket individuals reportedly keeping large quantities of cash, um, and the census says in sums of eight to ten thousand um, dollars, out of circulation and in reserve just for display at potlatches, not so much for um, use for buying things. In fact, the Alaskan economy as a whole depended heavily on the tourism and especially on the production of Alaskan native curios. curios. The 1890 census reported that Sitka, quote, is chiefly supported by the trade of the Sitka and Yakutat natives who sell their furs, baskets, carvings, spoons, bracelets, beadworks, etc., and purchase all their clothing and a constantly increasing proportion of food and utensils, unquote. This was a reliable, profitable trade and one in which the native vendors, non-native businessmen, and the steamship companies depended on each other for success. In Alaska, like other travel locales, the buying experience was a key part of the tourist adventure um, that the tourist literature had advertised. And then there were a variety of buying experiences for tourists to choose from, each with its own appeal, ranging from, from the familiar type of interactions at a trader's store to more adventures uh, into the Clinket and Kaigani Haida villages. And native artists and traders took advantage of all these venues um, by using the ability to sell at each kind of, in each kind of situation. So selling directly to travelers, supplying the white-owned stores, taking commissions from indigenous patrons as well. That was an important part of the market. I'm not going to talk about that part today. Native designs were also used by commercial manufacturers outside of Alaska and in cottage industries within, inside, within the territory. Um, and these are some of the bracelets that um, were uh, made by Billy Wilson originally and then became produced for the Curiosity Shop and by Metal Arts and are actually still, you can still order them from Metal Arts today. Artists seem to understand, oh sorry, tourist literature of the time advertised Alaska's native population as part of the landscape. Native people and artworks were an iconic part of the experience that people, tourists expected when they came to Alaska in the 19th century and images of poles, baskets, and people were ubiquitous in the travel brochures and promotional materials, as they are today. Artists seemed to understand what tourists were looking for, what they, when they were buying, and what they were willing to pay. 
and market demand was so strong that many traveler writers noted that the Clinket and Haida were skilled salesmen and women getting their desired price through a strategic lack of price bargaining. And in the village of Kassan, Stoddard recorded, quote, there is so much haggling over the price of a curio and but little chance of a bargain. If one has his eye on, upon some coveted object, he'd best purchase it at once at the first figure, for the Indian is not likely to drop a farthing, and there are others who will gladly outbid the hesitating shopper. So that was some advice in the uh, 1890s. No written records reveal whether Clinket women set their sales prices at collective meetings, but the likelihood of community knowledge, sorry, the likelihood of community knowledge over the going rates for certain objects, for, um, for particular types of objects, seemed certain. And many travelers were amazed at the uniformity of prices. Quote, one traveler uh, wrote, we came to the conclusion that there must be a trades union here, for the uniformity of prices was remarkable, and there was a positive firmness about the market. Unquote. Clinket salespeople capitalized on the consumers that the steamships delivered on schedule and en masse. And like the annual salmon runs, the steamship schedules allowed the artists to bank on a certain amount of economic activity on given days and throughout the summer. One of the most popular items, especially for female travelers, were silver and gold bracelets made to order for the tourists. A 19th century travel, travel writer, Eliza Skidmore, wrote that two of Sitka's silversmiths, Kuska and Sitka Jack, quote, worked day and night on special orders while the vessels at the wharf, unquote. And artists and sellers worked when the market was on, no matter what the hour. If they came in, sometimes the ships came in in the middle of the night. And a new narrow bracelet design was invented specifically to meet the ma demands of tourists. And I want to say as well that it was used within Native communities and, and was a very popular um, item in that way as well. But at the time, anthropologists talked about these. Ammons in particular recorded that the wider types took too long to make to keep the trade supplied for the tourists. And so this narrow one was one that you could, you could make in a day um, so that when someone showed up at the wharf, they could order a bracelet from you made to order for them that day. And this type accomplished a number of goals for the artists, all of which would raise productivity and increase profit. They could be made more quickly, thus replenishing your supplies between uh, the various ships' arrivals. They required less source material, were cheaper to produce, they could be executed on commission, uh, which gave the buyers an impression of a one-of-a-kind souvenir made specifically for them. Um, but the personalized service was really more fiction than reality. If you look through museum collections, you'll see that, uh, that silversmiths are making some of the same um, designs over and over and over again. Native artists carefully structured their industry and efforts to maximize their economic return during the brief but intense tourist season. And as a case in point, they capitalized on the interest in totem poles, turning their skills from full-size poles to small models. Curio stores in Alaska and all along the coast, especially in Seattle and Victoria, offered a dizzying array of model poles, many of them duplicates of a single design. Uh, one of the most popular, of course, was the uh, raven pole from Wrangell. Model poles were often um, localized allowing tourists to purchase a diminutive replica of the poles they'd just seen in the village and providing them with a representative sample of Alaska, as well as a memento of having seen the full-size pole in situ. Other sort of localized productions uh, included spoons, baskets, moccasins, wall pockets, um, all of these things decorated with the name of the particular um, place that you visited. So this is a model paddle from Fort Wrangell. Uh, this basket just says Alaska. It would work for wherever you've been. Um, souvenir spoons were commonly marked uh, with the names of villages and other ports of calls, like some, some of them have glaciers and miners. There's an amazing um, variation in all the various souvenir spoons made both by um, manufacturing production companies and shipped into Alaska and by local silversmiths. The native silversmiths competed directly with the commercially manufactured spoons stamped with the scenes of local interest. Log cabins, glaciers, salmons, bears, steamships, miners, um, and of course native motifs such as totem poles, shamans or witches, and even local individuals. Um, Chief Casco appears on one spoon which is, was produced by the Meyer brothers. Competing with these commercial vendors meant that indigenous artists had to capitalize on the tourist desire for authenticity by selling their works directly to the visitors or allowing visitors to watch them at work. 
this gave them an edge over the commercially made pieces. Cassan, uh, sometimes known as Haida, John, and Rudolf Walton were two artists who provided demonstrations of their artistic processes. Uh, the Klinkist artist, Johnny Cassin, was even featured on a postcard labeled, quote, Native Jeweler Making Bracelets at Wrangell, Alaska, so that the customer might document that direct relationship with an Indian artist uh, and send their postcard home saying, here's where I was and here's the guy who made the stuff I bought. Uh, none of this prevented artists from supplying the trader stores as well um, and taking advantage of that source of income. Well, these artists worked for the white-owned stores, a, a few artists were able to open their own stores, including Rudolph Walden and later Jim Williams. Stores owned by Native artists competed directly with the white-owned stores and had an edge over them by having the artist at hand in residence. And the Clinkett silversmith, uh, Jim Williams and his wife, uh, owned their own store, the Native Curio Shop in Skagway, sometime after the turn of the century. Like the interest in model poles that signified to tourists the vanishing beliefs of local Indians, travelers were drawn to other products that symbolized what they thought was vanishing or, or ancient materials, ancient practices and technologies, such as copper, um, which was thought to be this archaic material uh, associated with pre-contact productions, the most thrilling of which the products of those were the daggers. And Ash is going to tell us all about daggers, so I won't spend any time on that, but I appreciate your sharing your research with me for this paper. The Klingit were great entrepreneurs and found additional ways to tap the tourist market. At least one group of Klingits were involved in dance performances, and this is one of the earliest instances of, of heritage performance for tourists in Alaska. I haven't found one that dates before this. Um, Septima Collis described a dance group that was based in Juneau. Um, but had printed circulars as far south as Tacoma that you would receive before you got on the steamship so that you knew when you got to Juneau that your excursion would include seeing this dance performance. Um, and this, is, this was recorded in her 1890 journal. Um, this is the, I'm sorry, it's such a bad um, slide, it's, but this is a copy of the program that you could pick up in Tacoma on your way to Juneau. Um, and part of what it says is, quote, Native dance by the renowned dancers of the Klingit tribe of the Alaska Indians under the management of D. Martini, the Barnum of Alaska, and the celebrated Taku chief, Yash Nush. Um, and uh, Harold Jacob told me yesterday that that's Chief Johnson. The program for dances outlines that ancient dances, some purportedly out of practice, quote, since the days of Baranoff, and others performed, quote, more than 200 years ago. Um, so again, this is a typical tourist trope. Um, that was already in place in the 1890s. As well, the program highlights the expertise of the manager, testifying to his knowledge of Indian culture as signified by collections that he had made for the Smithsonian and the British Museum, and the quality of his troupe, as well as the great value of first-class attractions at popular prices, is what it says. Certainly appears that the program did deliver. Collis raves about the dancer's attire, the ermine skins, the blankets, and this is the image that she um, publishes in her journal on the left. Even the swirling eagle down. At the end of the performance, she and her fellow travelers signed the guest book, quote, to impress the tourists that followed us, unquote, and she went as far as to purchase the totem pole featured in the performance, that they had, the totem pole that they had out during one of the dances, and then you could buy that at the end. But Collis did not enjoy all aspects of her experience. Like other Victorian writers who describe the travails of searching for baskets and other curios in native homes in Sitka's ranch and elsewhere, Collis was discomfited at close quarters with the, with the dance performers and others in the small tent on the waterfront. And her account, like so many others, is replete with shockingly raw contempt and disdain for peoples whose practices and artifacts she so desired to witness and to acquire. So it must have been an exceedingly tricky balance for native vendors and artists to meet tourist expectations for authenticity and interaction while still accommodating Victorian standards. There was no one successful approach. Native people were damned for not accommodating to expected practices of dress, hygiene, and decorum, but also for being uninteresting and too modern when they appeared in Western clothing, um, as did Chief Yash or Chief Johnson, who appeared to call us. She wrote, quote, 
not in the garb of a warlike Indian chief, but in that of a quaint guardian of the public peace, commonly called a policeman, unquote. So she was disappointed in that aspect. Perhaps the only winning strategy uh, for native artisan vendors was to exploit all expectations and venues to accommodate the spectrum, the whole spectrum of consumer tastes and habits. Like postcard manufacturers that sold images ranging from, um, on your right, Yayik's A Civilized Bell, unquote, in Western dress, to those that pictured the Clinkett shaman with the tools of his kit, Clinkett sellers had to accommodate many tastes. So while some travelers ignored the trader's store in a, hus uh, in a race to get down to the Indian areas, others were assured of a, of a courteous reception. Um, in the ads, quote, for Rudolph Walton's store, it says, uh, in Walton's own store in Sitka, as Rudolph speaks English so well, they could feel comfortable there. These stark images of the civilized and the primitive reinforce travelers' expectation of a clear choice between the old and the new for Alaska's native people. But the reality was much more complicated, demanding a careful maneuvering between colonial demands, tourist expectations, and kinship obligations in order to navigate the colonial economy and chart a course for economic and cultural survival. Um, and I think Sergei Khan talked a lot about those, that difficulty of navigating back and forth in his uh, paper about the AMB this morning. Native artists did not always ground their material production in their own cultural aesthetics. They expanded their traditional repertoire to provide a variety of choices for tourists whose tastes ranged from the desire for what they called, quote, characteristic figures of the ancient animal deities, unquote, wrote one tourist, to others who had purchased uh, the scrolls, American eagles, and other designs what writers, of what writers called at the time civilized fashion, unquote. Basketry and silverwork provide the best examples of a plethora of imagery being produced. A number of new creations in basketry appeared for sale, including table mats, every possible shape of basketry covered bottles, and even virtuoso performances like uh, miniature basketry tea sets. And we have one of those at the birth. None of these were traditional to the Northwest Coast, but were all perfect additions to the Victorian cozy corner. Artists adapted many Euro-American motifs to their work in silver as well. The number of bracelets with these designs in museum collections attest to their popularity, and while a number of writers lamented the intrusion of non-native designs into their repertoire, they were clearly very popular sellers with the tourists. And these designs were not only popular with non-native consumers, um, but were part of the indigenous market for silver work as well, allowing artists to produce similar designs for all of their patrons. Floral engraved silver bracelets were popular with tourists, and the main consumer for these items were women. Nancy Pa's analysis of women's writing in Alaska notes that while women often decried the large and majestic landscape as too awesome for their powers of description, they had an impressive command of the nomenclature and botany of flowers and detailed their experiences with the wildflowers of Alaska. Writers of the time, women writers of the time, contrasted the delicate and lovely nature of these small flowers to the majestic but chilly grandeur of the vast Alaskan landscape. Silver jewelry and basketry decorated with floral designs, while seemingly copy and copies of Victorian floral work, might also have served as mementos of Alaskan experiences for these women in much the same way as miniature totem poles and canoes function. They were souvenirs linked specifically to places and people encountered on the Alaskan tour. In recent years, ecologists have quantified how salmon contributed to the sustenance of the forests and streams where they returned to spawn. If you saw the salmon in the trees exhibit, you'll know all about that. Um, perhaps the tourist trade played a similar role at the end of the 19th century, providing new economic possibilities for indigenous artists at the time. The height of, of tourism on the Northwest Coast coincided with the increased presence of missionaries, and tourists explored both the primitive practices, but the quote-unquote primitive practices, but also visited the bastions of, quote, civilization, such as Sitka's mission co cottages and performances by Reverend Duncan's Metlakatla band. On the one hand, travel writers deplored signs of change and acculturation, lamenting the modern influences that corrupted ancient practices and art forms, while others sang the praises of the mission schools, Christian education and training programs, the native people, um, and training programs. 
Native people were living with contradictory messages, one to assimilate and the other, quote, to produce their ethnicity according to archaic stereotypes, um, as Ruth Phillips discusses in her book on the Eastern um, Woodlands tourist art. Many artists and traders were caught in the riptides caused by the competing forces and learned to carefully navigate through these new waters. And the cash economy was one of the vessels that carried them through. Unlike studies of contemporary indigenous tourism or art market economies today, there is very little direct record of the strategies and, re and reflections of native artists or sales salespeople during the early years of tourism on the Northwest Coast. By examining the kinds of items they produce, sorry, by examining the kinds of items they produce, what these items look like, how they were marketed, marketed and cross-referencing travelers' letters and journals, we can start to fill in a broader picture of the time. But comparisons today to today's multi-million dollar cruise ship industry in Alaska would show some of the same techniques at play, though today only a minute percentage of the revenue returns to native hands. Um, that's a much smaller percentage than it was in 1890. But we see today the iconic use of indigenous identity in advertising, the miniaturization of indigenous symbols in the totem poles, houses, dolls, and native garb, um, the packaging of performances, and the direct viewing of and interactions with the landscape. The tourist runs that first spawned over a century ago are still recognizable today. Singe Kahna Sagu Ye Yuch Duastao Tika Kahna Ashley McClelland Yuch Duastao Yes Ahat City Hi, good afternoon. My name is Ashley McClelland. In Klingit, I'm known as Smiling Raven. And I just kind of want to take a big turn here as my paper is more object based. Um, so now we're going to talk about daggers. Um, and I'd like to begin this presentation by stating that my intent today is not to educate you on the creation and use of Klingit daggers. Instead, this will be a visual exploration of 19th century daggers and the linear changes in appearance and, and material. The information presented today was compiled over a two-year period when I traveled around the country to personally inspect over 300 daggers from the Northwest Coast. My presentation is a stylistic analysis of these daggers, and I allow them to speak for themselves. The form and imagery of daggers changed dramatically in the late 19th century as innovative Klingit metalsmiths used their ability to create objects that would appeal to tourists and collectors alike. I welcome any criticism and or comments on my presentation, as I am not only here to share, but to learn. Any information on this topic is greatly appreciated. I'll begin with a brief explanation of dagger vocabulary to acquaint those of you who are not familiar. Here you can see <clears throat> the terms in relation to their location on the dagger. We see the pommel, the blade, the upper and lower guards, which are only found on double-bladed daggers, um, the hilt, the thong, and the slit. One thing I noticed while writing my master's thesis on Klingit daggers was the shift in pommel imagery over time. This was due in part to the introduction of new materials and metal smithing techniques, but also to the appearance of tourists. The statistics presented here are from a core group of 240 Klingit daggers. The information revealed by, view by viewing these pommels side by side is extremely valuable. Imagery comparisons share the aesthetics of the Klingit people and can determine which imagery has depict, was depicted most frequently and why and when. After a brief history of the development of dagger styles, I will discuss the most popular anim, animal imagery for Klingit daggers. 
My only regret is that this study could not be expanded to include more daggers, and I acknowledge that these statistics are limited by the museum collections I was able to visit personally. Many early dagger pommels were undecorated, yet an early iron dagger collected by a Spanish expedition in 1791 demonstrates that decorated pommels were in use before this date. During my research, I only saw a few copper daggers with elaborate pommels, and I didn't find any double-bladed daggers with decorated pommels. This suggests that the strength of iron had already superseded copper by the time metalsmiths began to elaborately engrave and inlay double-bladed daggers. This is not to say that there were never any double-bladed copper daggers with pommel imagery, just that I did not come across any during my research, and if they do exist, they're extremely rare. The influx of iron and copper during the early contact period along with the wealth amassed by clans during the sea otter fur trade, contributed to an increase in daggers with elaborate decoration. As Clinket Smiths adopted Western metal smithing techniques, including engraving and chasing, pommel imagery became more sophisticated and complex. During this time, clan, <coughs> clan or personal imagery prevailed, and Clinket metal smiths created some of the most sophisticated daggers in the world. Soon, copper and abalone were added to enhance the status of the owner and served to create a more dynamic composition. Around the turn of the 19th century, foreign ships were bringing large amounts of iron files and trade blades. Clinket metal smiths were able to take a simple cross-hatched file and transform it into a sophisticated dagger. And here you can see some ridges from the original file on the very bottom left of the pommel. This demonstrates the superior skill and ingenuity of Clinket metal workers at this time. Smiths were used to working with whatever materials were available, be it an iron spike from a shipwreck or an iron hoop from a ship's water barrel. Blades made from files and ready-made trade blades gave rise to a new genre of daggers. I typically refer to this style as a hafted pommel. As the pommel and blade are separate, are separate pieces and hafted together, this, with this style, pommels created from a, are created from a wide variety of materials, such as wood, horn, ivory, bone, baleen, copper, iron, and brass. The use of trade blades on hafted pommel daggers eliminated the need for a skilled metalsmith and created a boom in dagger production. This is why the majority of daggers in museum collections today are of the hafted pommel variety. By the late 19th century, dagger production for use within the Klingit community had virtually disappeared. At this time, daggers were no longer used as weapons, and large iron daggers were no longer hand forged. In 1884, the Pacific Coast Steamship Company began regular passenger service to Alaska and by 1890, an average of 5,000 tourists made the trip each summer. The most popular landfalls for these status-enhancing cruises were located in Klingit territory. The increase in tourists renewed the production of daggers, only now the majority of blades were once again forged from copper, not iron. The desire to satisfy the non-native tourist market gave rise to an astonish astonishing variety of made-for-sale dagger types. Yet many copper daggers share a similarity with their false patinas, large wooden guards, and two-piece blades. Pommel imagery no longer referenced clan membership or inherited crests. Instead, designs were developed to appeal to non-native consumers. Other types of daggers produced for sale at this time display extravagant details that distinguish them as non-functional, and their collection dates link them to this time period. With this copper-bladed style, the strength of the blade was no longer paramount to the function. Aesthetics trumped strength, and these daggers were objects for display, not use. The majority of these daggers feature a copper blade with a single raised median. Unlike 18th century single raised median blades, these blades <coughs> are not, were not created in one piece. 
The slender rib was created separately and riveted onto the blade. The dagger maker worked hard to conceal the copper rivets and typically the area around them shows signs of this. And here on the right you can see towards the bottom there's two rivets um, in that raised part on the blade. Um, and also at the top of the blade on the left you can see some little kind of scroll work decoration that was also meant to appeal to tourists. Other examples replicate the look of traditional two-ray style, two raised line blade style, while others attempt to capture the sophistication of the fluted blade style. Despite the medial reference to historic blades, the artists were not actually creating the raised lines or elegant flutes. They were just mimicking the style. The majority of pommels created during this time represent a grizzly bear. What other fierce animal is more closely associated with the last frontier than this creature? This visual association with the untamed wilderness of Alaska most likely contributed to the success of this imagery. Numerous bear pommels were carved from sheep horn and covered with real fur. Their features were given an extra dazzle with abalone inlay and riveted copper highlights. Some examples have foreign line elements carved in the ears. Other pommels were created from two pieces of sheet copper riveted together, giving them a bulbous appearance. These forms were then engraved with foreign line design and inlaid with abalone. The pommels were then attached to copper blades. There were, however, multiple styles of copper clingit daggers being sold along the inside passage. It is likely that some of these daggers are simple, old copper double-bladed daggers that were engraved or embellished to make them more appealing to Western tourists. At this time, decreased population and suppression of the culture had taken its toll, and many families sold both heirlooms and newly made goods to support themselves. The quality and design of these engraved daggers are not uniform, and there does not seem to be a specific dealer who sold them in large quantities. Some have wonderful form line designs on them, and others have designs with no hint of traditional form line. These daggers were crafted in a classic manner, however, with a typical median shift in the concave back. This suggests that these daggers were forged much earlier and embellished later. Another style of engraved double-bladed Klingit copper daggers appears to be newly forged and does not conform to traditional Klingit blade forms. One example, example is a copper double-bladed dagger with a serrated lower blade. The blade structure and the engraved design signify that this is most likely a contemporary dagger that was created for sale. The word yak attack, which has been engraved on the back of this dagger, verifies that it was designed as a tangible reminder of a visit to this remote Alaskan village. And here, sorry for the picture, but in big letters it says yak attack. Some of these newer creations are flat on both sides, as if they were simply cut out of sheet copper and display simple, non-traditional geometric forms. The overall dimensions of their form deviate from the norm, and their shape and size are irregular. These daggers were quick, quickly made for sale, and they lack the sophisticated structure of examples created in the late 18th century. One interesting made-for-sale dagger style has thin pommels cut from sheet copper and engraved with form line designs. And I'm sorry, you can't really see the guards here very well, but um, that's where the form line design shows up um, on there. It's really detailed. The small blades of these daggers are constructed from iron and have a thin copper median running the length of the blade. It is clear that the Klingit smiths producing these daggers were skilled metal workers who were familiar with the intricacies of, form line, of the form line design system. Many pommel designs are frontal, but some depict the double-headed, but some depict split animal imagery that most likely references historical pieces, such as the double-headed killer whale dagger, Kikwala. These sheet copper pommels are thin and fragile, and once again, definitely not created for battle. Viewing all of these dagger pommels together fosters a respect for the talent and ingenuity of Klingit dagger makers. 
They demonstrate the hard work and dedication of Clingit artists and their desire to continually raise the standards of excellence. The pommel imagery itself can tell a lot about changing aesthetics and social adjustments. For instance, the pommel imagery on double-bladed daggers differs from hafted pommel daggers. The most popular images displayed on double-bladed examples are wolf, raven, and dogfish. Here, bear is the minority with only two examples. Whereas on hafted pommel daggers, it dominates with 29 examples. Whale was the next most popular crest on hafted pommel daggers, numbering 10. There are some double-bladed daggers that exhibit <coughs> a fin-like proje projection on the pommel. Some have faces in the center or circular abalone inlay. It is impossible to definitively say that these represent whales, but their presence should be known <coughs> as there is a relation here. The next highest numbers on hafted pommel daggers are nine ravens and eight wolves. When comparing these statistics against each other, it's important to know the cultural background of the Klingit people. The two moieties are raven and wolf, eagle in the north, and so it's not surprising that wolf and raven are two of the most popular images found on double-bladed daggers. Iron was, a precious, was precious prior to contact, so there were not a large number of daggers in existence. It would make sense that the oldest daggers represent the two main moieties and belong to the clan and not an individual. As time passed and trade allowed daggers to become more numerous, the imagery changed as well. This is possibly due to the rising number of Klingit men who own their own hafted pommel dagger and were able to create pommels with personal imagery. Individuals owned more than one crest. They could have their moiety crest, their clan crest, their house crest, among others. There were, also, there were also images relating to oral histories and clan accomplishments. Hafted pommel daggers expanded the visual diversity of Klingit daggers and changed the ratio of imagery. I do not know why there were so many hafted pommel bears, bear, hafted bear pommels. Oops. Sorry. Mm. trying to give you this, um, you probably saw it, there it goes, flash by. Um, so this is just an example of some of the bear pommels um, that I looked at, and you can see there's a huge array of uh, carving styles and inlay material and pommel material. Um, and so when, you, when I did my research, I put all of the images together of each animal type and looked at them all together. Um, and I had always hoped that maybe sometime in the future I would try to look at them together and maybe group some together that might have been carved by the same artist. Uh, but that was beyond the scope of my master's thesis. Um, but it's still really interesting to look at them all together at once. And that's just a selection. I couldn't fit any more on the page. <clears throat> Hafted pommel daggers expanded the visual diversity of Klingit daggers and changed the ratio of imagery. I do not know why there were so many Hafted bear pommels, but it raises some interesting questions. Raven and wolf are represented in much lower numbers, but still ranking in the top four. This demonstrates that these moiety crests were still important, but did not dominate. This is also true for the historic made-for-sale daggers. Out of 28 daggers, 10 were bears. The next most popular <coughs> was the anthropomorphic style, of which there were seven. Only two wolves and two eagles were represented, and no ravens. In this case, it is likely that the bear imagery was intended to appeal to tourists and has no reflection on clan affiliations. There are many more of these daggers in existence, and it would be interesting to compare a larger group. I hope this presentation demonstrates that comparative information on the variety of <clears throat> animal pommel imagery can be very useful 
and is something that could be further explored. Viewing carving styles and crest designs next to each other enriches the current information on dagger imagery and fosters further areas of exploration. I'm just completing two years of Russian language study in the hopes of continuing my Klingit dagger research in Russia. I hope to write my PhD dissertation on Klingit collections in Russia and would appreciate any suggestions, ideas, or advice any of you <coughs> could offer for the next step in my research. I spoke about Chilcat Phoenix at the 2007 conference, and today I'll be talking about the New Deal Twin Parks of Southeast Alaska. So, Gunachish for being here. Oh, I see. I just. Okay. At the end of the Great Depression, Clinket and Haida totem poles in Southeast Alaska underwent a radical transformation for the tourist eye. As part of a New Deal work relief program to preserve the nation's heritage, Clinkett and Haida men enrolled in the Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, removed more than 100 deteriorating totem poles from native villages that were no longer inhabited. Villages where the poles had stood in direct relationship to the graves, clan houses, and clan histories whose owners their crests identified. Moving the totem poles to larger towns in Southeast Alaska, the CCC then repaired or replicated these poles in carving sheds and A and B hall basements and re-erected them in the invented contexts of six totem parks in towns along Alaska's Inside Passage. The goals of this New Deal program were multiple, to preserve totem poles and the art of their carving by employing experienced Native elders to teach apprentices how to restore the poles, to provide Clinket and Haida communities with short-term relief work during the Depression, and to provide long-term employment for Native artists based on a sustainable tourist economy at the Totem Parks. And I should mention that the CCC did restore totem poles here at the Sitka Park, but that park had been established um, earlier by John Brady when he brought the poles there in 1902. The success of the New Deal Totem Parks depended on their ability to present totem poles to tourists as legible monuments they could understand and purchase in the form of miniatures, rather than the, than the mysterious curiosities that had fascinated yet frustrated earlier tourists to Alaska. As late as 1938, the year the CCC began its restoration program, an article in the Alaska Sportsman magazine titled The Indian Won't Tell complained about the lack of accurate information on Clinket and Haida totem poles in southeast Alaska. The author, L.L. L. Bales, quipped, Quote, when asked about the totem poles, the older natives apparently do not understand the English language, and the young people skillfully avoid the questions by giving evasive answers, unquote. Bales acknowledged that non-native ridicule of press stories might explain why some elders did not tell the totem pole stories. Still, he lamented the fact that non-natives were barred from understanding the meaning of the poles. If Bales echoed a common common complaint among non-natives about the obscure meaning of totem poles, however, Clinket and Haida people also worried about incomplete or inaccurate information disseminated about their poles. Writing in 1939 to photographer C.L. Andrews, Sam Davis, an elder in Heidelberg, and for those of you who knew John Wallace, who is John Wallace's brother-in-law, complained about Bales's article in the Alaska Sportsman. Quote, why do men try to write such stuff? It is, if it is worth finding, if it is worth writing, it is worth finding out. If Indians won't tell, they have reasons, and I find out most of them don't know the stories behind the poles, unquote. Davis suggested other reasons that Native people might refrain from interpreting totem pole stories, such as the fact that non-Natives rarely offered to pay for a telling that was traditionally remunerated among cultures on the Northwest Coast. But he also noted that many elders worried that younger Clinket and Haida people did not know the stories behind their own crest poles, 
and that something should be done to record the stories of totem poles for future generations. Oh, I'm going to skip that, sorry. In my talk this afternoon, I want to focus on the visual strategies the New Deal totem parks used to decode the crest stories of totem poles and to present poles as familiar monuments for non-native tourists. The most famous decoding effort of the New Deal was the guidebook, The Wolf and the Raven, which offered one of the first reliable accounts of totem poles restored or replicated in the CCC parks. Credited to University of Washington anthropologist Viola Garfield and Forest Service architect Lynn Forrest, the Wolf and the Raven paired descriptions of the poles in four of the New Deal totem parks with explanations of each crest figure, as well as providing transcriptions of the crest stories recorded from Native elders. But if the Wolf and the Raven is the most well-known of the New Deal's translation efforts, the totem parks themselves performed a crucial role in presenting the poles as familiar and legible monuments. And it is this aspect that I want to focus on in my talk today. As I want to argue, totem poles in the CCC parks were erected in patterns that related not to clan houses, grave sites, or other traditional arrangements of, of totem poles, but to the organizing principles of French and English landscape design as they had been interpreted by American public parks as well as by the model Indian village at World's Fairs. Presenting totem poles in sculptural landscapes that were already familiar to American tourists, the New Deal totem parks worked to transform the totem pole from esoteric clan symbols in remote native villages to easily accessible, understandable, and consumable monuments for the tourist gaze. Given the importance of the park layouts to recoding the poles, their radical re recontextualization of poles that had once stood in direct relationship to their villages, it is surprising that no study has no study has attended to the designs for the totem parks themselves. Analysis of the totem park layouts reveals that U.S. Forest Service architect Lynn Forrest followed two primary paradigms: one, a formal park with poles arranged symmetrically around a central axis following the French landscape tradition, and a park with more serpentine pathways and overlooks in the English picturesque tradition. These were radically foreign contexts for arranging totem poles, but they were familiar layouts for American tourists viewing monuments and park settings, and they helped to make the totem pole more accessible for non-native audiences. So I realize this is totally weird. We're at a Thinket and Haida conference, and I'm going to talk about English and French landscape design, but I think this is really important to how the parks were viewed. So we have to get a little background on these landscape traditions. The English picturesque tradition developed as a naturalistic, though man-made approach to landscape design in the 18th century. The publication in 1782 of William Gilpin's Observations on the River Wye marked the vogue of the picturesque landscape in England and spawned a large tourist industry to the private estate gardens of the English countryside. Defined by Gilpin as a landscape, quote, capable of being illustrated by a painting, the picturesque landscape translated many features of 17th century landscape painting into the physical space of English estates, with serpentine paths arcing across lawns, past man-made lakes, and through carefully arranged outcroppings of trees. The picturesque tradition also had a lasting impu impact on American public parks, with Frederick Law Olmsted planning Central Park in New York City with trails that meandered through the park's natural features and past the newly dug lake. The popularity of the picturesque also shaped landscape design in America's national parks, with the National Park Service working to maintain a naturalistic look of roadways into Yosemite and Yellowstone. Picturesque landscapes had arrived in Alaska long before the New Deal totem parks. At the Sitka Park near Indian River, Russian picnickers had widened the native trail to the forest in the mid-19th century. And in 1884, following Alaska's transfer to the U.S., Na Navy Lieutenant C.F. Gilman added other trails and bridges in the English fashion. Gilman planned serpentine trails that sought out giant spruce trees, Devil's Club, and other natural wonders in the forest. He also created several outlooks on the Sitka Sound. In 1907, Alaska Governor John Brady hired local photographer Elbridge Merrill to arrange seven totem poles that had been donated to him by Clinton and Haida leaders in an artistic manner, quote unquote, 
along the park's unwinding paths, adding to the picturesqueness of the park. Sitka was likely an important model for Lynn Forest design for the New Deal totem parks at Kassan and Totem Bight, as both of these parks were also situated outside their respective town sites and could spill into a large forested area along the shore. Forest designed the Kassan Park around the original site of Chief Sanahite's whale house, a mile northwest of the modern village of New Kassan. A 15-minute walk along a winding forest trail brought one from the village to the totem park itself, Crossing the bridge over Pristine Creek, the viewer wound past seven totem poles spaced at various intervals along the trail, eventually arriving at the whale house itself with its soaring frontal pole facing Kassan Bay. With the serpentine paths, the framed views, and the highlighting of natural features like the Salmon River, the Kassan Park rehearsed the conventions of the English picturesque. You might say I'm going a little far here, but I think it's interesting that they often paired these clan houses overlooking the water as would have been tradition with, with the idea of ruins in the picturesque. This was a big attraction for tourists to Alaska. Um, since I'm pressed for time, I'll just note that Totem Bight was also laid out according to picturesque ideals as these winding paths overlooking the sea. Forest, Lynn Forest placed the clan house high above on a on a point rather than placing it traditionally down on the beach. And this was, as he specifically wrote, to um, provide more picturesque views out onto the water. In contrast to the English picturesque model, Lynn Forest based three other New Deal totem parks on the formal French garden. Enshrined in André Lenotte's garden parks at Vaux de Vicomte and the Chateau of Versailles, the 17th century French garden was characterized by formal symmetrical planning around a central axis that aligned with the central balcony of the chateau, where royalty could take in the sweep of the garden at a glance. French gardens featured symmetrical parterres with long alleys, shaped trees, gushing fountains, statuary, and ornaments, the latter which often alluded to classical literature. Although the French formal tradition had less of an impact on American public parks than the English picturesque tradition, it was critical for the design of monumental centers in U.S. cities, like Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, or the National Mall in Washington, D.C. These monumental cores, in turn, had been influenced by the 1893 Court of Honor at the Chicago's World's Fair, seen here, where architects followed French paradigms of formal access planning organized by canals and highly coordinated neoclassical architecture. Forest design for the totem park at Saxman harkens most to the formal symmetries of French monumental cores. A long avenue lined on either side by totems, known as Totem Row, led to a semicircular park at the top of a hill, where paths radiate from the central hub in a goose foot pattern. Forest's careful siding of the 14 poles along Totem Row, row placing pairs like the eagle and beaver poles, the tired wolf house posts, and the beaver posts across the road from each other, reinforced the symmetry of the row and its strong axis toward the sem semicircular park above. To mark the entrance to the upper section of the park, Forrest designed two staircase entryways, one framed by two raven house posts and the other by two bears. Quoting the sentinels of marble lions or urns at the gateways to urban parks, these house posts were transformed from their role as weight-bearing crest markers in a clan house into familiar markers to the entryway of a public park. So again, all these efforts to recontextualize totem poles in familiar park settings so that tourists would, okay, these are monuments in a park, they're not these odd crest curiosities. Um, I'll just note briefly, Heidelberg is also, it's in this strong grid pattern you can see, and Forrest um, placed all of the freestanding, the tall exterior totem poles on the outer perimeter and then the smaller house close in the center, and created this very uh, gridded gravel pathway for viewing the poles. So this is nothing like you would have seen in a native village. The totem park's arrangement of totem poles in Euro-American landscape settings helped to present the totem pole in familiar aesthetic settings for American tourists, working to recode the pole from a curiosity to a monument in a sculpture park. But if these radical new contexts for the totem pole catered to non-native tourists, 
Clinton and Haida peoples intervened to ensure that the New Deal totem parks were still legitimate sites for the display of their crests and for their cultural practices. The Wrangell Potlatch, seen here, celebrated June 3rd and 4th, 1940 in the city of Wrangell, is a good example of Native intervention. As a two-day festival to mark the completion of the CCC's restorations to the clan house and totem poles on Shakes Island, the Wrangell Potlatch drew heavily on the model of a miniature Indian of a model Indian village at a World's Fair. An organizing committee printed official stationery for the Wrangell Potlatch Inc., sending invitations to dignitaries across the country. Local businesses prepared exhibits of their products. The Reliant Shrimp Company, an exhibit of shrimp, crab, and other aquatic life, and the Boy Scouts, a wildflower display in the downtown window box. Clinkett members of the Alaska Native Brotherhood rehearsed the authentic Indian ceremonies that the potlatch had advertised and prepared to name 81 year old Clinkett Charles Jones as Chief Shakes VII. By opening day, June 3, 1940, 1,500 out of town guests had arrived in Wrangell more than doubling, doubling the local population. <coughs> the local newspaper welcomed the auspicious crowd with a full schedule of the day's events and an article that proclaimed, quote, Wrangell now takes its bow as Alaska's foremost tourist attraction, unquote. In its presentation of the Totem Park alongside the display of natural, of local resources and native performance, the Wrangell Potlatch rehearsed many of the trappings of a model Indian village at a World's Fair. These fairs, what Andrew Carnegie called the National Reunions of the World, began with the Crystal Palace exhibition in London in 1851 and became a major advertising mechanism for nations to display their resources, inventions, and ideologies throughout the early 20th century. World's Fairs often included exhibits of indigenous peoples featuring model villages that showcased typical architecture and even live performances of native dance and ceremony. They were thus a familiar context in which non-natives could encounter indigenous peoples and their material culture. And in fact, totem poles had become a stock item, as you can see here, of American World's Fairs. The first time totem poles were introduced to an East Coast audience was at the 1876 World's Fair in Philadelphia. And then you can see John Brady built his model Indian village with a blanket clan house and totem poles in 1904 in St. Louis. And just before the totem parks, the New Deal parks, there was this exhibit of totem poles at the 1939 World's Fair in San Francisco. So it was a very um, familiar context for viewing poles. The speeches on opening day of the Wrangell Potlatch made a point of discussing the totem poles as American heritage and historic attractions for the community and the nation at large. On the local level, Wrangell Mayor William Fisk thanked the CCC, quote, for this historic attraction for the town of Wrangell. On the federal level, Bureau of Indian Affairs Commissioner Claude Hurst and U.S. Forest Service Regional Forester Heinzelman hailed native cooperation in the U.S. government's restoration project of, quote, this important heritage, unquote. Yet if the totem poles in the New Deal Park at Wrangell were recoded here as, a, as America's own heritage, Clinkett individuals ensured that the poles continued to be read as clan crests and that the celebration of the New Deal totem park further their own cultural needs. Photographs of Clinkett individuals during the Wrangell Potlatch reveals their reveal their pride in displaying their heritage to the public eye. Many brought out their button blankets, masks, and chilcat blankets that attest to pride in their clan crests. Some Clinkets pair traditional regalia with contemporary clothing. And you can see here on the right, Ethel Lund thought this might be Mary Maiasato, and you can see she's wearing her Converse sneakers along with her chilcat blanket and feather duster. So. I, I think this wasn't just a performance, an authentic performance for non-native tourists. It was also a celebration of their own heritage and regalia. Most importantly, Clinkets used the Wrangell Potlatch as an opportunity to restore the Nanya Ayi's Nanya Sati lineage with the naming of 81-year-old Charles Jones as Chief Shakes VII. Chief Shakes VI had died in 1916. But due to interference by local missionaries and government sanctions against native governance, the successor had not been named. 
With the restoration of the Shark House during the New Deal and government approval of authentic Clinket culture, however, local Clinkets could now name Charles Jones as Chief Shakes the Seventh. And significantly, the official ceremony to name Jones as this chief took place not at the touristic dedication of the New Deal totem parks at Shakes Island, but in an afternoon celebration hosted by the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Alaska Native Sisterhood in the A&B Hall downtown. Hosting the naming of Chief Shakes in the A&B Hall, the Wrangell Clinkets could ensure that they carried out Clinket protocols alongside the touristic spectacle presented at the New Deal totem parks. It was but one example of the intervention that Clinton and Haida peoples orchestrated in these New Deal parks, even alongside the work of the parks to present their totem poles as familiar monuments of American heritage. Thank you. for inviting me, Katie. Can everyone hear me? Okay, nobody's shaking their head no. Well, you guys, your presentations were so good. You set the bar so high. I think I should give you guys a little bit of context for my talk today. Um, I've been working in indigenous tourism and native tourism and arts for a long time. My work right now is actually comparing uh, Alaska Native corporations with other corporations and other Anglo settler colonial states. But Katie invited me to do this, and one of my contracts is working with a major research network out of Simon Fraser University called IPINCH, which means Intellectual Property and Cultural Heritage. And they have a bunch of researchers and academics working with communities all over the world. Most of them are indigenous on issues of intellectual property. So I took this invitation as an opportunity to revisit some old research I had done. Um, on Northwest Coast art and apply um, some of these IP issues. So whenever I say IP, it's intellectual property. So some of these intellectual property issues um, apply to that work. So it's kind of a beginning of a work in progress. I'd appreciate any feedback. So uh, with that, I'll go. About half of the $80 million in retail purchases made by tourists in Alaska each year are presented as native arts and crafts. But the Alaska Department of Commerce and Economic Development estimates that 75 to 80 percent of what is displayed as Native work is not made by Alaska Natives at all. In addition to having to compete with non-Native and mass-produced art in the marketplace, Native artists must navigate complex legal, cultural, and ethical issues in order to take part in the commercial art world. These issues are especially complex for Northwest Coast artists who need to make decisions about the ownership of certain images, designs, and art forms, and what, contact, and what context these things can be used in. So um, I already mentioned that I'd done some research before. I can't believe I'm this old. We're all this old. It was 14 years ago. <laughs> I interviewed about uh, over 30 uh, Northwest Coast artists from all over Southeast Alaska. Some of you guys are here. Uh, that's awesome to gain an understanding of how um, artists experience the contemporary art market in Southeast Alaska. So um, I'm, I've integrated a lot of quotes from people I've talked to uh, that regard to these IP issues in this talk. And I specifically did not include any Sitka artists, so nobody would have to recognize themselves this time. However, I did, um, I did make an executive decision yesterday to name the people who have since passed on since I did the original research so you could hear what they had to say. But the rest of the quotes will be anonymized. So here's a sample of what people told me about the art markets. One person said, it's nice to know that things will be off this continent and people will be showing it saying, hey, I got this. This was made by a real Alaska native. It feels good. Here's another one. I'm learning to make a living from my art. That's the thing that's taking me the longest to learn, is how to deal with the gallery. But it takes time to work your way up. There's another. The shops around here, and especially some of these old time shops, they've taken advantage of artists for years and years, and it still goes on to this day. It's a shame. And the way the shop owners look at it, they look like they're doing the artists a favor, you know? There are legal protections in place to protect Alaska Native arts, 
artists' rights to safeguard them from unfair comp competition and misrepresentation. And, they all fall, and these, these protections fall under the category of intellectual property or IP law. But the main problem with IP law as it exists is that it's fundamentally European in or origin and therefore supports Western notions of individualism, individual ownership, commercialism, and capitalism, as opposed to, for example, more indigenous notions of collective ownership. In this talk, I'm going to outline the basic difference between both cultural approaches, uh, the first approach being uh, Klinget Protocol, and the second approach being Western IP law, specifically to the US, presenting a basic set of dilemmas that Northwest Coast artists face as they try to make and share their work across cultural divides. So um, you probably saw the title of my talk. I had kind of a fancy one. Uh, but I saw this quote as I was writing this paper. And I think if I make it, it's original as a better title for my talk. And that I'd honor a very original, wonderful artist, Jim Schopert, who some of you probably knew. So actually, let me. So I'm going to start with talking about uh, protocol as it pertains to intellectual property that fits under the general concept of atu. Atu, which translates roughly to mean own thing, uh, is a concept central to the Clinkett worldview. I'm sure most, if not all of you, are very familiar with it, linking social, spiritual, and material aspects of the universe. Uh, I have a lot of definitions of it, but I'm just going to share one that Paul Jackson once gave to me. And he said, atu is something the clan has, something in their history that has happened. So they would put it on something, a totem pole, a carving, or a robe, a chill cat robe. And this becomes part of the history of the people. And they would take care of it from generation to generation. And it becomes atu. And there are many things that we call atu. And shika is our ancestors, where we come from. And this is where we learn to do the many things that we do. Um, when I asked artists to explain the difference between traditional and contemporary art, many of them referred to this protocol, this customary law. Uh, Louis Menard defined traditional style with regard to Atu. He said, the way it was developed in the past, the traditional form lines, the way our ancestors developed it, so that it is traditional but only for them. When we carve, and we think it's done exactly as it was done in the past, and today a lot of them are doing the contemporary which they sell to the public. But for our people, it's always the traditional form lines with the traditional detail because it's their property and their crests, and they're the owners of it. So that brings me to the first dilemma. Should you ask permission to use atu in making commercial art? A lot of artists draw a line between what they will and won't include in their commercial work. For some people, that means sticking to the most generic designs that no one clan can particularly claim is atu. Um, here's what one person had to say. There should be no traditional designs or subcrests on anything you make to sell. Baskets should have no traditional designs, and other objects should only be decorated with eagle or raven crest symbols. Somebody else said, we will modify the form lines and also rearrange the details so it does not look like the traditional emblem of our peoples. So if we make it different, then our people won't fuss at us for selling their property. Another person said, I feel free to carve any of the crests that are of my clan. But other people seek to use permission to use specific crest designs. So one person said, if I have permission to use a crest design from one person in a clan, it could be honoring the clan, but it's hard to ask permission for crest designs. Another person said, I try not to depict a story without permission. It's really complicated because as far as the ownership goes at U, ownership was something that was already created not something potentially created. So traditional leaders, they don't have the authority to demand ownership of what I'm about to create. But some people in the area want to assert power they don't have. Maybe they feel they've been disrespected in the past, so they feel resentful towards those who disrespected them. Another person said, there are certain things that a person should not do, and if you want to do it, make sure you have permission before you do. There's another one. I, I really like these, obviously. They're, I, I found a lot. I even cut some out. If I had complaints from a clan member because I was carving their crest, first of all, I would investigate if they actually did own the crest. And if that was the case, I would make amends or payment, compensation for the use of that crest. But it just doesn't happen that often. 
Today everybody just carves whatever they want to carve, and today that tradition of respecting whose crest you are carving is gone. Here's what Esther, Esther Shea had to say. You have to ask permission even before you use your own design. Excuse. Many artists will work with most designs, however, um, without feeling the need to ask permission whatsoever. So one person said, today everyone just carves what they want to carve, and today that tradition of respecting whose crest you're carving is gone. There are certain stories that clans own that you may really want to get permission when carving a totem or something like that. And, and another more cynical person said, I do carve all designs. Those rights are long gone. So uh, total, completely the entire spectrum of, of, of opinions here. So let's compare Clinkett Protocol to Western IP law. Intellectual property law includes arts and crafts as tangible objects. It includes copyright, trademark, rights to design, and protection against misrepresentation and unfair competition. Everyone has a legal right, everyone, native, non-native, anybody, has a legal right to make any kind of art he or she wants to, as long as they may remain within the boundaries of the law as it applies to specifically copyright, trademark, and rights to, rights to design, and protections against misrepresentation and unfair competition. Western IP law can only protect, protect traditional knowledge if it's commodified for commercial sale, such as an artwork or a patent. So any kind of artwork that is made outside of the commercial realm, it's not going to be sought, bought or sold, no money changes hands, that is not protected under IP law. Comparing IP <laughs> to AU, we know that AU is generally considered something outside of the realm of commercialism, and it does act kind of like a license. Uh, those that have the rights to use a clan design, for example, may use it for personal, ceremonial, or other kinds of reasons. One example that illustrates the difference between AU and Western law is the question of public domain, which I have seen come up in a lot of these talks. So public domain. Public domain are works whose intellectual property rights have expired or forfeited or are inapplicable. Older ethnographic works of art, including those held by museums, generally exist in the public domain. They're not protected by IP law. So all of the wonderful images and photographs of 19th century and older art objects that are held in museums and public places like that, they're all in the public domain. So uh, according to law then, they have no IP rights. Anybody can use any image of anything that's in the public domain. Um, and, and this is just an image I put up here. of uh, it's, There's Jane D'Angeli and Susie Fair and me, and I, we all kind of helped on the Chilcat Pendleton that SHI made for a fundraiser about 12 years ago. Um, oh, yes, and also uh, Johnny Marks worked on it as well. And uh, so my job was just to assemble all of these kind of artworks in, in the public domain, and we decided to use a base of a uh, diving whale chilcat design, of which I found a number of different ones in museums in the East Coast. And then Johnny just kind of altered it about 20, 30 percent, and, um, and we made sure that uh, we had images that showed uh, both eagles and ravens on it. So this is an example of how we use public domain up here. So a great number of artists told me that they refer to art objects that are in the public domain for inspiration and ideas. So I'll just give you a couple quotes. One person said, traditional style. Old style is what I call it. I look at the old stuff and try to get that look and feel. And here's something representative of almost everybody told me that they look at old books. A lot of people didn't have the luxury of visiting collections and museums. They probably would have. They could have afforded to go, but everybody could get books. Everybody talked about books, but I'll just give you one quote. I've got a good collection of books. I like the books that have all the old artwork in it. Public domain. However, if an artist were to make a replica of an ethnographic object from a museum that's in the public domain, he or she does acquire the copyright over any new or added features and over the specific form of the regalia. So this is kind of a weird kind of legal nuance that's hard to figure out. You're replicating an old piece, but you just change it a little bit, then you've got copyright over the new piece. 
this is kind of problematic because what if that object is Abu, but it's not yours and now it's yours because legally, by Western law, you own the copyright to it. Very interesting stuff, I think. So copyright is the right of an author to control and use his or her works. So as soon as you make a piece of art, it's under your copyright. You don't have to register it anywhere. As soon as you make it, it belongs to you. Belong but it belongs to you as an individual. Copyrights give the owner the exclusive legal right to reproduce, publish, sell, or distribute artwork. A copyright allows you to control how your creations are used by others. A copyright gives you the right to stop unauthorized copying, adapting, displaying, distributing, or the selling of your work without your permission. Copyrights can also stop other people from making new works created from the original artwork without your permission. But there are some problems with copyright. Unlike at -u, which is perpetual in most cases, current copyright only lasts 70 years after the life of the author. So, in essence, it's inadequate to protect um, indigenous cultural property or art held collectively or in perpetuity. In other words, most of which would be considered at -u. But it does protect an artist's original design until 70 years after their life is over. Who owns the copyright for commissioned artworks? Copyrights do not apply to art, to art made for hire or under any employer or commission. So if you're commissioned to do a basket, for example, the person who commissioned you owns the copyright to that piece. Um, if you work for um, some kind of an establishment that has you making art and you don't work this out in your legal contract, they own the copyright to whatever you make under their employment. I think um, that's really important for people to know. When I talked to some artists about this, one person told me um, that he wouldn't copy designs that somebody else has made, and if he's asked to do a special design, he won't do it, and he told me he's protecting himself and his copyright. I think he knew the law. Another person I asked, do you like making commissions better? And this person said, I like the challenge. It keeps it fresh, like it would be something different. It would be mine and it wouldn't be duplicated. Some people request that they don't be duplicated, so they want to tell people they have the original. Um, and then uh, when I was asking uh, Jimmy Marks about, um, about commissions, if he, if he liked them, he said, he said, yeah, yeah, I like them. Um, he said, we were talking about heirlooms that people get through commissions, and he said, I like them, and then I get more money also, another old Indian trick. Um, and and he, I think Jimmy had it right on. Um, I think commissions are great. There's a lot of public artworks, and it's a really great way for people to, um, to make a living. But if you're going to do a commission, just make sure to charge a lot more money for it than you would if you're doing your own piece to sell to a gallery, for example, because as soon as the commission is out in the hands of the commissioner, they have the right to mass produce it or control anything about that image that you create. Next issue, should I sell the copyright to my original artwork? Now, I don't know, I, I, this, this image here of Todd Jason Baker's t-shirt designs, I don't know if he sold the copyright to it. I was just looking for something representative of this idea, so I don't personally know him. I just found this online this morning. So um, selling copyright. Um, a lot of people think that selling copyright hurts other artists because you're killing your own market. Somebody else makes money off your designs and you only get paid once. Again, if you only get paid once, make sure you get paid a lot. It's like all these sitcoms on TV all the time. They're always showing Roseanne over and over. Or, oh, no, 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 The Brady Bunch. This is a perfect example. The Brady Bunch stars, they just got paid once when they did the shows in the 70s. And had they gone, had they known to get the rights to their, to their property of what they did, all that syndication, they'd all be cajillionaires. But they're not because... They sold their, their performance once, so they kind of got screwed. So just make sure you charge a lot or work something into the contract. But here's what some artists had to say about it. There was one guy that's a wholesaler, and he travels around, and most of the things were kind of like originals to cast. I have some cast pieces out there, and I sold the rights for them right off. And he travels around like, like the pins and the totem poles. Those are all his, so I don't get any royalties back. This, this person understood how it works. 
And then he added, he usually catches me in the winter when things are getting tight. Another person said, this guy wanted me to do a bunch of castings of my work, and I was ready to go and do it. And I took off, and I thought about it, and thought about it, and I was like, no, I can't do that. If I go and do it, it's like stabbing myself in the back. Trademarking. The legal purpose of a trademark is to protect corporations from having their products imitated or wrongfully appropriated by others. <laughs> this is another example of why IP law is so Western. It's about, it was created for corporations, not people. Um, and so I guess we now know corporations have the same rights as people, if you've been following that. But uh, unlike copyright, trademarks remain valid as long as they're in use. But they only cover material used in commercial trade and have no ability to protect non-commercial forms of cultural and intellectual property. The Silver Hand Label Program is, is a kind of trademark that al enables Alaska Native arts to be more easily identified and differentiated from non-native works or copies that may be available. Here's what artists had to say about the Silver Hand Program. I think it's good, but I think the state needs to invest more time and effort in promoting it. It's great that we can use that. If all natives used it, it would put everybody else out of business who's making replicas. Sort of. However, the use of labels only works when consumers are educated about specific labels and how labels function as an indication of originality or authenticity of the products. So when consumers are misled, um, labels don't work. So here's what somebody else said, and um, yeah, I'm just going to say who they called out on this. To see somebody like Jack Tripp get the Silver Hands representative, knowing full well he's selling Anglo art right next to Silver Hands products, so that everybody is misled into thinking that everything along the wall is Silver Hand. That makes me sick to see that. They wouldn't even investigate who they were giving this to. But he did get spanked with like a $20,000 fine or something eventually. Only person I've ever heard of getting really fine for that. Um, another person said, but I think that program of the Native Arts with the silver hand on it, that's a good program there to help somebody that doesn't know how to tell it's Native ma made and getting revived because it was a big issue about things getting made in Bali. That's where the guys would even change their name to Eskimo sounding names and they got tags that said Alaska made and it wasn't. While labeling can't stop the counterfeiting of indigenous products, it can provide an advantage in the marketplace since labels provide the consumer with the ability to differentiate the fakes from genuine art. But even with the Silver Hand program available and managed by the Alaska State Council on the Arts, a lot of artists still have trouble with it. First of all, there's the difficult paperwork involved. Second of all, it, um, it forces definitions of, I, I think that it reproduces in the public mind that being Native Alaskan is homogenous. Like, it's all the same thing. Um, and it also forces artists to fit within whatever the State Council on the Arts decides is a Native artist, um, which, which should maybe be, be decide tribe by tribe or clan by clan or, or something to that degree. It, it doesn't really differentiate. And the silver hand this, with this homogeneity thing, it doesn't really differentiate between tribes or clans or anything like that. So um, what else is out there to protect Northwest Coast Artists IP? In addition to trademarking and labels, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990 adds an additional layer of protection for Native artists. This law makes it illegal to offer for display or sale or, or, or sell any art or craft product in a manner that falsely suggests it's reproduced by a Native American or the product of a, a particular tribe or Native arts organization. Between 2006 and 2010, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board received 649 complaints of alleged violations of the Act. And, and I've been digging and digging for this, but as far as I know, nobody's been prosecuted in Alaska. But they do a lot of um, hand slapping and, and educating people who do this. Um, a lot of complaints in the Southwest. So what do you do if somebody steals your design? This is a classic example. I didn't want to pull up any local examples because I didn't want to, it's kind of sensitive. But um, Prince Harry, a number of years ago when he was in, in college, made these lizard designs that were based on Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal art. And the um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Corporation or Commission in um, Australia 
um, wanted to uh, bring a suit against him and bring attention to this. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that IP laws are not really enforceable on an international level. WIPO, it's so, oh my gosh, World Intel Intellectual Property Organization. They're trying to rectify this, but they're not really doing it. And, and I just thought I'd throw that picture of him in his not Nazi costume just to show you kind of like where this kid's attitude is at when he just thinks, you know. Anyway, what should you do? The Indian Arts and Crafts Law is a truth and advertising law designed to prosecute people from claiming that non-native art has been made by natives, but it does not protect individual artists. So what can you do if someone steals your specific design? Unfortunately, as far as I've looked into it, it's a big pain in the ass. Um, your copyright protection, it is automatic, yes, but not any trademarks or patents. Any trademarks or patents, like the silver hand, um, these have to be registered with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office or with Customs and Border Protection to protect your intellectual property. If your rights are violated um, and it's at a trademark level, you have to do it through some kind of a corporate entity. If it's violated at a, at a, um, at a, uh, copyright level, then you as an individual can pursue it. Um, and if you, and it, as an individual, if, if you're pursuing it, then you can file a lawsuit for infringement, obtain a court order to stop the sale of important infringing goods and money damages. And um, I have to say, uh, I didn't get my deposit back from a vacation rental, and I'm still trying to small claims the lady, and it's been over a year, and it's a big pain in the ass. I mean, I'm sure this is just... If the theft is international, you're screwed. <laughs> so, unless they bring it back to the states. So, we've got some real issues with the law for native arts. So, um, from a public policy, this is, this is my last slide here too. From a public policy perspective, IP laws generally don't take into account the organization needs, concerns, or aspirations of native communities. IP law as it stands does not Real, it does not really protect traditional knowledge and local protocols that are described in concepts such as au. So, just go over a couple of these. Can you make an IP claim over au? Not if non-commercial breaches are involved. If there's something commercial involved, some kind of exchange of money or goods, then then maybe you can do some kind of a claim. Although a, a clan can't make a claim. Who makes the claim? Maybe uh, maybe the tribe, the incorporated tribe, uh, an IRA tribe, um, an Alaska Native or Village Corporation certainly could make the claim because these laws are made to protect corporations. Trademarks can only be filed and litigated through corporate entities. Copyright and trademark law does not cover collective or perpetual ownership. It just doesn't. So forget making a claim over that. Patents have limitations. Copyrights only apply to commercial arts, and copyrights are finite in time. So we've got a challenge. Um, the challenge is to come up with a new legal framework to support and protect indigenous knowledge systems. Um, what that would be, I, I know there's people working on it. Um, who would handle claims? I don't know. That's kind of like the next step in this project. So thank you. Somebody turn the lights up for much? Thank you. Um, everybody was very timely, and it's uh, 5 o'clock, although according to the schedule, our break is 5.30 to 7. So we can dismiss and talk individually, but we can uh, also take a few questions if anyone wants to have a little discussion right now. Questions for any of our speakers?
not a specific plan. These things that are, that are in the public domain. But I think they mentioned, now those aren't original collections we're going to replicate. So I don't know that they would, they would put those digitized information out for everybody. But if, if that were to happen, that's, I think, where it would get sticky. But there's nothing legally to say that they can't do that. There's nothing to protect that. Um, yes, museums can, but I think it's going to be for all of them, I think. I asked a specific question and they said, yeah, they put restrictions on the types of in the U.S. if it's in public domain. So this is for like the whole world. So like let's say there's some art collector in, I don't know, Bulgaria who has like somebody's chill cat blanket and it's a one of a kind thing. And if they own it and let's say Bulgarian IP law says, says that if they own the object and they own the image and everything, they're not gonna respect um, point of protocol. But this trademarking system they're working on it's kind of like a way around that that would say that they're legally obligated to let the clan that owns that atu uh, on that blanket to use it for whatever non-commercial, ceremonial, anything they want to do. So that's a project they're working on. I mean, without getting, you know, in trouble legally. Okay, thank you all for coming.